Hey, good afternoon, everyone from snowy Chicago land. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Understanding Pre-Painted Metal, uh, which today is presented by Steelscape. This is another in our series of webinars from Metal Architecture Magazine. I'm Paul Deffenbaugh. I'm the Editorial Director at Metal Architecture, and uh, we're glad you've joined us today. Thanks very much. First, let me apologize about the date change. I know that screwed things up for a few of you. Uh, it's the first time we've done that. Uh, so handling the communication of it was a bit of a learning curve on our part as well. Um, as a saving grace, the webinar is going to be recorded and everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording in an email tomorrow. But I did want to apologize about the inconvenience and any miscommunications. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to Michelle Vondren, who's our speaker today. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you interested in AIA credits, and or certificates, you'll earn one HSW learning unit for this course, and all of that will be reported automatically. Please give us five business days to process that. And for those of you who are looking for just certificates, that also will be handled automatically, and also please allow us five business days. Uh, if you get beyond that five business days and you haven't received the credits or the certificate, just drop me an email and I'll follow up. Uh, we'd love to get your questions today during the webinar. Michelle's a wealth of knowledge and you're going to want to take advantage of that. So uh, use the panel on your screen and, and submit your questions that way. And at the end of each section, I think we've got four sections here. I'll bring the questions to Michelle and of course we'll answer questions at the end. Um, but now let me introduce Michelle Bondren. Uh, she's the technical manager for NS Blue Scope Coated Products North America. She graduated from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, with a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. Uh, Michelle started her career as a research chemist at Morton, which later became BASF, BASF Coil Coatings, and uh, with a focus on polymers. This position also included lab development as well as lab to production scale up and manufacturing quality and process control. Um, eventually, Michelle shifted to the cool pigmentation side of things where she brought the first cool coil coatings to market. She was active in the Cool Roof Rating Council and Energy Star Roofing Program. She joined Steelscape as a quality engineer for the Rancho Cucamonga paint line. And while there, she has held the quality systems manager role and is now the technical manager. Michelle oversees quality systems and technical service for Blue Scope Coated Products North America, which comprises Steel Scope, Steelscape and ASC profiles. Uh, she's an active member of the National Coil Coders Association, sits on their technical committee, as well as Zinc Aluminum Coders Association. And uh, let me also add that Michelle is a regular source for us in our magazine, so you'll probably see her there. We value her expertise, and I'm sure you will as well. Thank you very much, Michelle. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Paul. Great introduction as always. And again, uh, apologies for the date change that <clears throat> rests solely with me because I am uh, flying to snowy Chicago tomorrow. So mm -hmm. I'm ahead of your way, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you all very much for uh, working with us on that. So we'll jump right in. There's a lot to cover. As we said, we'll take questions at the end of each section. That seems to work better than waiting till the end. Um, so here is the uh, provider information uh, that you already know in our contact, it's the one credit, as Paul mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, our four sections today are going to be understanding pre-painted metal uh, fundamentals, that application process, what that manufacturing looks like. We're going to talk about the uh, three most common types of paint we see in the industry, their differences and appropriate applications. Then we're going to talk about some enhancement options for specific sites or, or types of buildings and locations. And then at the end, we'll finish up with uh, durability and warranty considerations. So what is pre-painted metal? It's fairly self-explanatory. It's a, a roll of steel or aluminum or any other metal, but steel and aluminum, the most common, that has had its paint applied prior to fabrication. So we apply the paint to the rolls of steel or aluminum, and then it goes uh, from that process to the roll forming, stamping, or fabrication process afterwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not all pre-painted metal is the same. Uh, you got to make sure you get the right coating, the right substrate, um, take into consideration lifespan, energy efficiencies, and visual appeal and design. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the common construction products that we use pre-painted for um, is pretty wide range. So metal roofing, standing seam, metal siding, 
commercial, architectural, residential metal uh, gutters and roofing accessories, insulated metal panels, composite panels, uh, metal roofing tiles. But we also do pre-painted metal for, for non-construction, uh, non-architectural uh, applications as well, such as HVAC appliances. Most of our appliances these days are coil-coated or pre-painted metal. Cabinetry, um, hot water, heater wrappers, that white that everyone has on their hot water heater, that's coil applied. Door trim, ceiling panels, window trim, filing cabinets, um, those kind of things as well. So pre-painted metal fundamentals and how is this paint applied? Our first question, um, how is paint applied to metal for the majority of building applications? We kind of have four options here, airbrushed, dipping process, rolling process, or the brushing process. And for us, it's rolling, uh, but not like most of us think of rolling on paint, like in your house for an interior. This is a large scale industrial sized rollers. It's a picture here of that, of the strip being painted green. Um, you can see the roll sitting in front. These rolls are eight to 10 dia uh, inches in diameter, moving at a high rate of speed. This is a schematic of kind of a generic paint line. Um, there's many different uh, ways to put a paint line together, but they all have some of the same basic steps and processes included. Um, it is a continuous application. So we attach the end of one coil to the beginning of the next coil so we don't have to stop. Um, run continuously, we, the metal is cleaned uh, thoroughly first uh, with an alkaline cleaner. We put some pretreatment on and then the coatings on after that. Uh, these lines run anywhere from 100 feet per minute up to 700 feet per minute. So it's a fairly fast dynamic process. The application of the paint and the curing or drying of that paint is anywhere from only 15 to 30 seconds. So uh, the old phrase, it's like watching paint dry, doesn't really apply to this type of painting because it is very, very quick. And applied at a very um, thin, thin layer as well. It's the fastest and thinnest coating process in the industrial coating world. Um, a nice comparison is cars, uh, automotive coatings most people are somewhat familiar with and can understand analogies with. Modern cars take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to fully paint all of their um, components and body parts. Whereas we can run one coil in about 20 minutes that can you know, build almost in, you know, hundreds of buildings. Um, thousands of square feet of product in a very short period of time. There's some really great videos out there. If you want to see how this actually looks moving, you can go to the National Coil Coating Association website and there's other websites. You can just Google it and there's a lot of videos of different paint lines. Uh, so you can see how this actually all works and how fast they move. So there's a lot of advantages to this, um, right? It's a very highly controlled process. Um, get a lot of consistency of color and product from run to run. Can do large quantities in a short period of time. Um, it's a very efficient use of paint. We're applying this paint very, very thin, 1.4 mils thickness. Uh, by comparison, paper is two to three times thicker than that. So this is thinner than paper but incredibly durable um, and long lasting. So um, not a lot of product, uh, but giving you a lot of benefits. Most other industrial coatings, including car uh, paint, is anywhere in the two to five mils thickness range. So several orders of magnitude greater in thickness. And because this paint is applied before fabrication, it has to have a lot of unique properties. It needs to be hard, durable, but also flexible, right? You gotta be able to bend it and mold it into the final shapes uh, and application that it's gonna go in and then hold up for long periods of time uh, on the exterior of a building in all conditions. It is a closed loop system. It's our solvent-based paints, but we are capturing those VOCs during the painting process in our ovens and burning them and actually then use that heat that's generated from the burning of the solvents to help fuel the ovens online. However, it's not all rosy. Uh, it, it's a great process, but it does have some limitations. The scale of it, the size of it, um, this is what a, a paint line looks like kind of in person here. Very large, they tend to be several stories tall. They hold anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 uh, linear feet of product at one time from end to end, so they're, they're big structures. 
very rapid, so you can do a lot of the same product uh, consistently for you know a long period of time. But this makes it difficult to do small custom work. Um, most coil lines or paint lines will have uh, fairly large minimum order requirements. Uh, you know, it's, it's challenging to change paint quickly. Uh, you don't want to change paint a lot during a shift because that's inefficient for the line and adds cost to the process. So sometimes you get a little bit of a restricted color palette because of that. Um, it, but you can get custom colors, don't get me wrong, but it may be more costly and there could be longer lead times than the standard palettes. Quality control, again, this is one of the huge benefits of this process is um, how tightly controlled and consistent this is. Um, we do a lot of testing off the line, uh, both to test for formability, uh, since this stuff has to get formed and fabricated after the fact. So we simulate that doing what we call T-bins, where you fold the metal back on itself. You look to make sure the paint is not cracking or opening up. We impact it with weights and make those dimples that you see there and the photos on the bottom. Simulates the stamping process, handling process to make sure it's going to hold up. And then, you know, aesthetically, color is hugely important, uh, right? You want consistent, even color, not only from end to end in a coil, but across the width of the strip. And then from run to run, um, you know, if a customer orders, you know, red number two, um, several times a month, but in different production runs, it needs to look the same every time it runs. And we actually control color uh, to a tighter tolerance than what the human eye can pick up. So really good quality control. We look at the gloss, how shiny it is, that is spec. Film thickness, very critical, not only for um, how it looks and consistency of color, but for the long-term performance. And like I said, we will get into warranties, but the warranties on these paint systems can be upwards of 40, 45 years these days. So your film thickness is critical to that long-term performance. But we wanna take a few minutes to talk about um, what's underneath the paint, right? So there's a metallic coating. Um, we don't coat directly over bare steel because we know that that rusts and doesn't hold up well. So uh, we're usually painting over galvanized or an aluminum zinc alloy over steel. Um, galvanized product, like the galvanized product is 100% uh, zinc, whereas galvalum or zinc loom, the two most common trade names for 55% aluminum zinc, um, you know, has that aluminum component in there, which gives it a little bit better performance corrosion wise, kind of the preferred product for big architectural installations. 55% is the optimum ratio. I'm always obligated to point out that this is a licensed product. So if you're if someone's using the name Galvalum or Zincalum, uh, they do have to have a license to do that. It is trademarked. Mm -hmm. So the reason the Galvalum or Zincalum product is so good is that is the aluminum, which is an inert uh, protective barrier, whereas the zinc is a sacrificial barrier on the surface. So most uh, zinc aluminum coated product does come with a corrosion warranty, while your galvanized product will not. That warranty is usually 20 to 25 years uh, in standard environments. There's some exceptions for marine and heavy industrial, mm -hmm. um, but it, that can be discussed ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Solutions uh, developed. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to dig into the paint a bit more. And I, yes, I have a degree in chemistry. I'm not going to make anyone do chemistry. We might talk a little chemistry, but I promise no, uh, no hard science today. So. We all know what paint is, right? It's a liquid that we apply to a surface, adheres to a solid film. Uh, usually has two primary, uh, you know, obligations. It needs to look good or look a certain way, and it needs to protect the surface of whatever it's gone over. So, again, we're all familiar with typical brushing, dipping, spraying, vacuum coating, and rolling applications for paint. The paints we use is. Um, again very specific and very thin so the primary components are for the resin or the polymer or binder um, of the system this is going to give the paint its primary physical and chemical properties how flexible it is how, how well it's going to hold up um, out in the environment you know is it scratch resistant or is it soft whatever it needs to be that's usually going to come almost all from the resin or the polymer then we have pigments Again, self-explanatory, that's to impart color. Although, as we'll see later, pigments do play some other roles as well, but the primary one is color and look. Solvents, as I said, these are solvent-based paints. So um, 
we have to be able to handle this product to get it on the line to code, right? It needs to be in a liquid form that's easily transferable from the drums to the coder head, easy to clean up, is consistent to work with, uh, but those solvents are driven off in the final product. Uh, Pre-painted metal that goes out the door finished is zero VOC. And then there's additives, um, and this is a wide range of, of things. Uh, could be UV blockers, it could be to help with flow, um, it could be to give some extra corrosion protection. Um, so those the very small component, but very important, uh, a lot of those additives. And those tend to be custom formulated for the specific end use that the product is going to. So here's a nice like just little cheat sheet of what each of these components is bringing to the table and the role that they play. Again, the resin or the polymer, durability, your hardness, your flexibility, your adhesion, your gloss, chemical resistance, corrosion resistance, all those things there come primarily from that. Your pigment's gonna bring your color. It's gonna hide the substrate, um, hide that surface well so it looks good. Pigments do also provide some corrosion protection. Film strength and water resistance can also come from your pigmentation. And then the solvent, again, is really for those of us on the application side, uh, the viscosity, how it flows out on the strip and be able to handle it uh, with ease in the production process. And here's kind of the rough breakdown of what each of those components is as a percent by weight. Um, so pretty even distribution between the resin, the solvent, the pigment, and then a little bit of additives. So how do you Pick the right paint. Um, and we're going to get into specific paints a little bit uh, later, but you know it's a balance, right? So you need it to be hard enough that it's not going to scratch. It's going to, you know, withstand the forming process, and you can get it installed without causing damage to it. But then it's got to be flexible enough to go through the forming process um, and get made into its final part. So for most building product applications, roof and wall. Um, we, we tend to lean a little to the right on this scale. We want it to be a little bit harder, knowing that we're sacrificing a little bit of flexibility, but we know that that's going to give us a good, um, durable product once it's installed, but also get fabricated without too many issues. So a little bit more about pigments. Uh, they're insoluble solid particles. You grind them up and disperse them with the resin. So those really fine particles kind of attach themselves to the resin or the backbone of the paint. Uh, there's two primary uh, kinds of pigments that we use in the industrial coatings world, um, inorganic and organic. Inorganic pigments tend to be your earth tones or kind of duller yellows, reds, greens, browns, and blacks. These are iron oxides. Uh, they're incredibly durable. They often are uh, fired at high heat to make them incredibly stable, at which point they're considered ceramic pigmentation. Long, long je je uh, longevity. They're not going to fade in the sun. Uh, they're not going to break down with UV rays. Your organic pigments, however, which is what most people are more familiar with, are your primary colors, your bright reds and blues and greens, very pretty colors. They look great, they don't hold up well out in the real world. I think we've all seen faded red cars. Uh, we've probably seen buildings that were a bright color at one point that are now uh, faded or they take a sign off and you can see the difference um, over time. So we use organic pigments in small combination with the inorganic pigments to get the colors we want. So you can get a bright red um, in an industrial coating. Uh, it'll be balanced with some inorganic pigment and if it's a very clean, bright look that you want, you may need to have to put a clear coat over it, which again, most people can equate to your car. All of our cars have clear coats to add durability and to prevent that color from fading over time. Color, very important, right? Especially in the design world, but also for us uh, making the product. Um, right? It's how the eye perceives light and reflection. We control color numerically via computer uh, programs as well as visual assessment. So we will read color on the three scales, the light dark, the yellow blue, and the green red. Um, again, we hold that to a tighter tolerance than what most human eyes can pick up so that from run to run, no one can see any variation. Um, but we also always do a visual assessment as well to make sure it looks the way it should. Mm -hmm. 
And yes, we do colorblind test our uh, lab operators to make sure that they can see color mm -hmm. appropriately. Mm -hmm. There's more than one layer of paint on this product. Um, so we start there with the core, our metal substrate, which we talked a little bit about. And then you have that metallic coating layer if it's still either galvanized or a zinc aluminum coating. And then on top of that, the first layer that actually goes down is what we consider a pretreatment. Um, this gives a good base to the substrate for the rest of the paint to adhere to, kind of edges the surface a little bit. It's also providing some corrosion protection. After that layer, we uh, put primer down. Our primers are pigmented for corrosion protection as well. They kind of have a yellowy green color to them, which is um, a strontium chromate pigment, uh, which has very good corrosion resistance built into it. Uh, that's a very thin layer. Again, helps with adhesion and flexibility uh, once the top coat is on there. Also uh, kind of evens out your surface like most primers would, even you know, priming any surface. It gives you a nice even base to work off of and um, hides any minor defects that might be on that substrate before you put the top coat on. Then we put the top coat, it's your color coat. Uh, it goes by those two names, which may be one layer, maybe two layers, may have a clear coat depending on the application. But we also paint the bottom side of the strip, even if it's not gonna be exposed or viewed in the final application. We do that for several reasons. One is for corrosion protection, uh, but it, more importantly is that in these coils of metal, if you rewrap bare metal against the painted surface, you're probably gonna get scratching and marring of that painted surface uh, during transport and handling uh, in the fabrication process. So uh, we often just put what we call a backer on there, kind of a half coat, usually an off-white or a gray um, that looks nice. Um, but is there really for protection purposes? That said, um, most paint lines can coat full color coats on both sides of the strip if it's needed or desired. There are certainly um, times when the design is such that the panel is gonna be viewed from both uh, sides and you want it to look the same, and that is possible. Okay, common paint systems and their differences. So we'll stop there uh, real quick to see if there's any questions on that first section. Don't have any questions yet, but I, uh, a couple of people have asked, uh, and I'll remind you that you're gonna get an email tomorrow and people will be able to download uh, the slides as well as be able to review the a recording of the presentation as well. But you're doing great, Michelle. Thank you very much and keep on okay, going. Okay, onward we go. Full disclosure, there's gonna be a little bit of chemistry in this next section, and that's it, I promise you. So, um, can you name the three common paint systems used in building applications? Hmm. They are polyester, silicone modified polyester, or SMP for short, and fluorocarbon or PVDF. It also goes by about five other names because for whatever reason as an industry, we wanted to make it confusing for everyone. But these are the three big ones, polyester, silicone modified polyester, and fluorocarbon and we will get into the differences and the pros and cons of each of those. So um, a note here, the fluorocarbon or PVDF technology, uh, which is the highest end paint system we're gonna talk about. It's also known as polyvinylene fluoride. There's a little bit of chemistry for you. Also goes by the trade name Kynar 500 or Hylar 5000. You will see this product called out in architectural specs. It's in the core of engineering specs. Um, been around for a very long uh, time. But you do have to have a license. If you're a paint manufacturer, you gotta have a license to call your product Kynar or Hylar. It is a licensed technology. Mm -hmm. Polyesters, these are the workhorse of industrial coatings. Um, very cost effective. They have great, they can be formulated, have great flexibility and hardness, a huge range of colors and glosses. Very versatile, um, used in a lot of different applications. Everything from actual from roofing and siding to gutters and downspouts. Uh, it's what you would use on an interior application as well. So appliance wrappers and T-bars and ceilings and door frames and window frames are typically polyesters. Um, and I like to make an analogy here. The polyester chemistry in its whole is vast. So if you think about that we wear polyester clothing. We wear a form of polyester that looks like clothing, but we can also make that same chemistry into a paint for a building. That's how vast this family of chemistry is. Um, and it can do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's a workhorse, been around a long time. Mm -hmm. 
Silicone modified polyesters are kind of um, a cousin. So this is a polyester resin backbone that's been uh, modified with some silicone. And uh, what that does is it adds a, a greater amount of weatherability and durability in the exterior world. It improves the resistance to chalk and fade uh, on a building or a roof. So it is a step up. Again, available in a wide range of colors, a lot of glosses, um, it's very versatile. We see it a lot in light commercial and residential applications. So a little bit lower cost than the PVDF, the top of the line. Um, and I will say that the, the gap in performance over the years between SMPs and the PVDFs that we're going to talk about next has shrunk tremendously. Um, there used to be much more of a differential in performance than we see now. So fluorocarbons, the third and final, this is the Cadillac um, of industrial coatings for pre-painted metal. Um, they have exceptional chalk and fade resistance. They have incredible chemical resistance and excellent formability at the same time. Uh, fluorocarbon PVDF is one atom at a molecular level different than Teflon, uh, which a lot of people can kind of wrap their head around. We all know how durable and, and great Teflon is on cookware and other applications. This, these two items are very closely related to each other. So that's the kind of durability uh, and finish that we're talking about. Um, again, this is often called out in the architectural specs, large commercial installations, um, anywhere you need, um, that you have unusual conditions like marine, which we'll talk about marine or heavy industrial, uh, some kind of corrosive or harsh environment, you're going to want to go with a fluorocarbon or a PVDF paint system for that use. Getting a little cheat sheet here on um, some of the good, better, and best. Uh, again, the polyesters are just huge ranging. Um, it's really hard to even lump them kind of into one category. There's a lot of subcategories within the polyester family. They can be anywhere from good, decent performance to, to quite good performance. Um, but they are cost effective. Warranty because of that range of performance characteristics also is kind of a, you can drive a truck through it. There's everything from no warranty on polyesters to pretty good moderate 20, 25 year warranties, um, depending on specific formulation. Again, very versatile, um, lower end agricultural, um, residential, mm -hmm gutters and downspouts. And then I've got the AMA specifications here that, that dictate each one of these. SMP, as we said, is a bit better. Uh, it's a nice middle of the road product, high to medium durability, um, fairly long warranties, uh, 25 to 40 years, depending on supplier and end use. Wide range of applications for this product, everything from residential to commercial, a good wide range of colors, good gloss options. And then the best, the PVDF. You're going to see warranties that are you know, typically 30 plus years at this point on this paint system, high-end architectural, has excellent chalk and fade resistance and chemical resistance. I will say here, the one limitation of PVDF, slight limitation, is they typically don't like to formulate it in the very high, it's hard to get a very high gloss paint. It's also difficult to get a very pure, bright primary color in it because of that pigmentation. You now have defeated the point of having this good resin um, and you'll have to use a clear coat or something else over the top of it to get good performance. So they like to stick with the inorganic pigments that we spoke about earlier that are more the earth tones and mid tones for the PVDF system. Whereas in polyester, uh, more comfortable using organic pigmentation. So again, some reminders here, right? The considerations. Um, polyesters, not all the same when we're talking polyesters. We just discussed a wide range of performance attributes within that family. Um, and, and the differential in performance between a high-end polyester and an S&P can be marginal these days. And again, the gap between an S&P and a PVDF has shrunk um, over time. But the PVDF is still the best UV resistance and optimal exterior durability. It's going to carry the longest warranties out in the field. Mm -hmm. Um, Kynar, again, 500 and Hylar 5000 is the trade name for this product. You have to be licensed to make it. And if you're licensed and you're using those products, uh, the paint itself has to be 70% of that resin. Um, 
and that is dictated and checked routinely to make sure it's meeting that criteria. Okay. Another pause for any questions? Yeah, we, uh, thanks, Michelle. A couple of questions. I, I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, you had mentioned polyester is becoming kind of closer to the SMP and the SMP is narrowing the gap with the PVDF. Are we seeing spillover like SMP now being spec for high end architectural, or is it still kind of everybody's in their own silo? I've not seen, I, I still see PVDF spec um, the most. What we're seeing though is sometimes the spec is not calling out a paint system, it's calling out a warranty requirement, right? It'll say needs to be 25 years with a prescribed chalk and fate performance. And that's important because an SMP may very well meet that warranty requirement uh, without going to a PVDF. So um, I when paint is specifically called out i'm only still seeing pvdf but i also see a lot of specs where it's just asking for a performance criteria with no specific paint attached to that um, at which point there should be a discussion with whoever the supplier is going to be at the panels as to what you know pvdf probably meets or exceeds it but maybe you don't need that high in the end of product mm -hmm. uh, depending on the warranty requirements mm -hmm. one of the attendees is asking are there different grades of pvdf Yes and no. Uh, I, I'm i not intelligent enough to talk to all the grades of PVDF. The, the PVDF that's used in this industry, our industry is the same grade, comes from the same couple suppliers. Um, but there is other PVDF, you know, PVDF gets used in a lot of applications. They get used, uh, right now the biggest demand for it is lithium ion batteries and electric cars is eating up a lot of PVDF. It gets used in a lot of electronics, uh, applications and so yes it's possible that there's some different quality grades there that I'm not familiar with in that electronic space it, it, mentioning the competition for the lithium batteries for PVDF somebody's asking about the shortage of PVDF and an alternative yep. to it yeah it's um yeah it's been a big topic for the last year uh, caught the industry kind of off guard uh, right now they are bringing extra capacity online for PVF manufacturer, but that's 18 to 24 months out. Most of the industrial paint companies have secured allocation and allotment, uh, so their supply is secure. There's just not a lot of room for growth. And this is a, it's a good topic. I mean, this is where maybe an SMP is sufficient, right? Depending on the end use and the warranty requirements, maybe you don't need a PVDF huh? um, and you don't have to worry about that supply and performance will be good enough uh, for the end use. But yeah, it's been tough. And uh, most of the new capacity for PVDF that is coming online is gonna be solely for the EV lithium ion battery world, mm -hmm. not for industrial coatings. So, right, and I think we can all agree that that space, that market is just gonna continue to grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think the PVDF manufacturers are gonna be playing catch up for a little bit of time and COVID impacted it too. A lot of the production of PVDF came out of China, um, you know, and they had kind of full shutdowns, stopped manufacturing altogether. So um, it wasn't just batteries and, and cars that uh, were the supply issue. There were some other factors, but it has leveled off and it, it's in a better position than it was a year ago. But uh, yeah, certainly I uh, have discussions with your supply chain and to see if SMP is good enough, because it may very well be. They use the same pigments. Um, and like I said, that performance differential has um, is not nearly the gap it used to be mm -hmm. in the past. The, the technology for SMP and polyester technology and the use of pigments has risen mm -hmm. quite a bit in recent years. Thanks. I'll, I'll do a shameless plug. We did an article about the PVDF shortage in metal construction news. You can see it on yes. the website there. Um, actually, I think, Michelle, you participated in that article. Thank yeah. you. Um, got a yeah. bunch of other really great questions, but I want to make sure we get through the material, so why don't we keep going here? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Enhancement options for pre-painted metal. So what are the important building considerations that can influence the type of pre-painted metal you're going to want to use? Mm -hmm. um, these are the big hitters right here. Proximity to saltwater is huge, marine locations, uh, building energy efficiency, 
type of color and look that you want. The visibility of the roof surface, um, you know, within its community and neighborhood can be important. The type of light reflection or gloss or shine off of the roof is important. And then also what other materials you're going to use in conjunction with the pre-painted metal, like, you know, wood, other types of metal. There's some cautions there uh, that need to be understood. So the biggest enhancements that we see are listed here. So the first one that we see a lot of is very popular, the micas or metallic pigments. So these are your kind of sparkly silvers and champagnes and bronzes um, that are commonly used, especially on big building uh, installations. We see that a lot, very common these days. Clear coats, we talked clear coats already, uh, can be used over a very bright, organically pigmented system to give it extra durability. Um, in performance. We can also use clear coats for marine and industrial enhancements to help protect against corrosion. Uh, also see clear coats needed sometimes in military installations for um, like blowing sand abrasion uh, in desert locations, um, places like Afghanistan and the Middle East uh, where things might get installed uh, where there's a lot of blowing dust which is quite uh, detrimental to a painted surface over time. Graffiti resistance. Uh, there are clear coats uh, and paints out there specifically that uh, not only is it hard to get graffiti type stuff to stick to, they're also easier to clean off once they do get tagged. Uh, cool roof pigmentation, that's energy efficiency, so reflecting heat away from a building. Textures, um, give you different looks, and then prints and imagery are available as well. So the mica is a metallics, uh, it's a nice kind of gold, uh, copper color here, right? Typically we used to use metal flakes, um, actual copper flakes in the paint, um, which is why it has the name metallic. These days it's usually a mica pigment, which is much more durable, uh, doesn't need to have a clear coat over it, but the industry still uses the term metallic uh, for this look. Um, and this can be a very subtle sparkle or sheen or a very large sparkle. I've seen some uh, paints recently that have a very kind of big sparkle in them. They, they look very cool, uh, depending on the color you use them in. And then there's also pearlescent or shifting colors. You see this more in automotive, a little bit in buildings, but more in automotive, right? Depending on how you view the angle, it might change from purple to blue or to green. Uh, that's done with a mica pigmentation. Caveat, a word of warning on micas. They are batch sensitive. You cannot mix different production runs together because we cannot control the color that well. And it's the way that that pigment lays out and reflects light that we can't control. So um, two things that can happen here. One, you can mix a batch and you get a subtle color difference. They're also directional. So, you know, we, we run the strip one way through the line and apply the paint. If you cut panels off of that and then turn one of them 180, with a mica, you will see the difference in how that light is reflected off of that pigment. So you gotta make sure that they're all installed in the same direction. Uh, a lot of paint lines will actually put uh, directional arrows on the bottom, uh, so you know which way it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So extreme environments, this is what we run into the most. Um, mm -hmm. It said marine mm -hmm. application, especially out here on the West Coast where I'm based. Um, right? Salt water is incredibly corrosive um, and we need to protect against that. So marine paint systems are typically going to use a thicker layer of primer, maybe a different formula of primer. It'll have its color coat put on and then often also a clear coat on top of that just to beef it up a bit. And um, by doing that, you can still get a warrantable product near the ocean. It may not be 30, 40, 45 years like a standard product in a standard location, but you can typically get a 20 or a 25 year warranty. Uh, but if you're gonna be designing and doing something within, in the range of definition of marine changes between paint suppliers, but if you're anywhere from right on the seashore to a mile away, you need to be having a discussion about whether you need a special paint or not for that. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the uh, graffiti resistant stuff. Um, it's very easy to clean off. It's a very slick, tightly bonded surface, so it's hard to get anything to stick to it in the first place. And then again, clear coats do a lot. They can add to a harsh environment protection, but also give you a depth of look that's different, a gloss that's different, 
can also increase the hardness, maybe add a little protection, like I said, abrasion protection uh, from clear coats. There is a little bit of a color variance that occurs. We call them clear coats, but at the end of the day, they're not truly clear. They have a slight yellow tint to them, and that is due to the UV blockers um, or the sunscreen that's put in there. So if you put a clear coat on the top here as a white, if you put a clear coat or a high build primer under that white, it does shift it a little bit from, you know, the left panel here is just standard primer, no clear. Then we have a panel with high build primer under it. And then at the end, high build primer and clear coat. And you can see that that color has shifted slightly visually. But on your darker colors and your midtones, you're not going to be able to pick it up. The difference is minor. Talked about backers earlier. It's often overlooked or taken for granted, but it is playing an important role. Uh, usually unseen, except in open uh, pre-engineered buildings, you do see it. So we do color control that backer for those applications. Usually a neutral color. Um, you know, on eaves or overhangs where that backside is going to be observable or viewed, you might want to consider doing some kind of color coat or a full coat that's going to look like a more finished product. Cool colors. So these are infrared. <laughs> Uh, reflecting pigments that were introduced about 20 years or so ago. Um, so what the pigment companies were able to do is they took some of their ceramic pigmentation and were able to alter them structurally and chemically enough that in the visible light range, they stay looking the color they were. But in the IR range, they're now reflecting more radiation, uh, which is where you get your heat generation from. So reflecting the IR wavelengths, which the eye can't see, but you're keeping that visible spectrum the same or very close to what it was before. So you can get dark colors that stay cooler in the sunlight. Um, any paint can have these pigments added to them. Um, they've actually become pretty much the norm in the industry and the standard pigmentation that's used. There's a few applications where you want heat buildup um, and you want non-cool, but that's pretty rare these days. So you're reducing the heat buildup in the building. You're also reducing the heat island effect that occurs um, in metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. There's some terms that go with this. It can be a little confusing out there. Um, solar reflectance, that's the amount of solar radiation being reflected off that surface. That is not the same as light reflectance value. It's a very different property. Light reflectance is around how light or dark a color is. Um, Solar reflections is about the, the reflection of that IR radiation. Emissivity is the amount of heat a surface can dissipate away from itself once it's gotten heated. You take those two values, you do a very long, nasty calculation, you come up with the solar reflective index or SRI value. Um, this you will see in the lead specs um, out here, Title 24 in California, a lot of the building codes now, especially in the Southwest, will have an SRI uh, requirement or target in their building codes for roofs. Cool Roof Rating Council is a third party that monitors this, verifies everyone's numbers that they're legit. Um, so you're not just having to take someone's word for it. I will point out that unlike other materials, right, because our paint systems have such long durability and hold their color for so long, we see very little change in this SRI value with time as opposed to other types of roofing and building products whose SRI tends to deteriorate in three to five years pretty quickly. Um, metal will keep theirs, actually sometimes goes up a little bit as it ages rather than down. So it is an advantage that it has. And again, uh, you all probably are much more familiar with LEED than I am, but yeah, there is the um, reflectance roof guidelines in that lead spec for low slope and steep slope. You can see the initial SRI for low slope is an 82, then age SRI of 64. That initial number of 84 or 82 is really gonna limit you to white for the most part. But on steep slope applications, you get down to 39. That allows for mid-tones and some slightly darker colors uh, to be used. Gloss and sheen, very important in the metal world, right? A lot of the people don't like metal or they say they don't like metal because it's glary and it's shiny and it, you know, it hurts to look at it because you're getting blinded by the light um, coming off of it. Um, and what controls that is what we call gloss and sheen. So gloss is the measurement of visible light at a 60 degree angle off the surface, whereas sheen is that same measurement, but at an 85 degree um, angle off the surface. So high gloss sheen 
will result in high glare or high shine off of a surface. Mm -hmm. You get to low gloss and low sheen, you get a non-shiny, non-glare surface and can actually get a very matte finish with no shine or reflection at all. Mm -hmm. Again, this is different than light reflectance value, which just measures the total amount of reflected light um, rather than that concentrated angle. So LRV is used to assess dark light, mm -hmm. uh, whereas gloss and sheen is what's going to dictate that glare or reflection off the surface that sometimes might be objectionable. I know that I would not want to wake up to my neighbor's house uh, having a horrible amount of glare through my windows. Um, we've also for years seen gloss and sheen restrictions around airports and military bases, right? You don't want a pilot suddenly blinded by the sunlight off of a roof as he's trying to land your aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, but we are seeing a movement in the industry to lower gloss, lower sheen in general, because um, it's just a better aesthetic look, mm -hmm. especially in residential. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of that. So um, this example here, these two grays, these are actually the exact same color numerically. Mm -hmm. um, one with a normal gloss sheen and one with a super low gloss, low sheen. And you can see that visually the difference uh, that that makes. Mm -hmm. And we use this, we can get to this a couple ways. There's flattening agents, some of those additives that can be used to the paint. You can do a textured finish. So that texture breaks up how that light reflects off the surface and diffuses it. And that can be achieved both chemically and or with actual physical particles added to the paint. And then we can get these ultra matte finishes. Uh, we've just got some examples here of how the LRV, the light reflectance value, is the same for these blacks, but they have two very different looks because of the gloss and sheen. Mm -hmm. And that their SRI values, the solar reflectance value, is again independent of that and very similar mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Here's uh, some examples of decorative or what we call imagery or print aesthetics that can be um, achieved. Mm -hmm. A uh, couple different ways to do this, either kind of with a printing technique or just using different uh, carved rolls on the paint line. So we modify those rolls to have a pattern and apply two different colors to get that look. Pretty short timeline to develop. Um, the downside of this is you do have a repeatability on that roll, right, as it's turning. So these kind of random patterns uh, look best, so you don't see that repeat. Uh, as predominantly. There's also laminates. This is actual imagery printed on a sheet of film that is then bonded to the metal substrate and you can get true imagery, right? Picture type look with this. Uh, we see this mostly for, you know, inter interior applications. Um, Actually, don't see it here in the U.S. as much as in Asia. It does not have as great a durability and UV resistance. It's just straight painted product. Mm -hmm. And that film bond can be problematic uh, to the substrate as well. Mm -hmm. uh, see it mostly for like faux wood doors, some garage doors, accent pieces, things like that. And then digital printing is becoming, uh, there's a lot of advancements in this. It's actually like giant laser printers that go on a paint line. Um, and, and use paint uh, to make an image non-repeatable. Uh, so really interesting development work that's come online in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Large scale version of a traditional digital printer. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions on that section? We, the questions are rolling in, Michelle. Uh, a <laughs> quick question on, you used the phrase high build primer and uh, somebody's mm -hmm. asking what that preface high build means. So a high build primer, a high film primer. So most primers are applied at a 0.2 to 0.3 mil range. For uh, marine and industrial applications, oftentimes we will bump that up all the way to like a 0.7 or a 0.8 or even a one mil of primer. So it's a substantial increase in primer. It's often the exact same primer that you're running at the lower film, you're just putting more of it on. Um, but it is run at what we call a full film. It's almost as thick or as thick as the color coat that's gonna go on. Uh, thanks. And um, another person asking about uh, the three different paint types, is there a difference in the ability to recoat them? Can be, yes. Excellent question. Um, and it actually is somewhat dependent on the paint supplier and their specific formulation. So as a rule of thumb, polyesters are recoatable. 
Some SMPs are recodable, some aren't. Some PVDFs are recodable, some are not. Um, yeah, sometimes to recode, you, uh, and by recodable in my world means that you can recode color to color, right? So you don't have to put primer down again. Uh, but worst case scenario, most suppliers allow you to go ahead, if you need to repaint a coil for some reason, you can put another layer of primer down and then put another top coat down. So there's uh, options for recoding, but it, it does vary by specific paint supplier. A um, bunch more questions, but let's just keep going on. We're about five after, we got about 10 more minutes to finish the last okay. section. Okay. Next section, pre-painted metal durability issues in warranty coverage. So what are the three common elements warranted uh, on a pre-painted metal product. Hmm? There's the metallic coating corrosion performance. If you have a aluminum zinc modified substrate, hmm? then there's film integrity and then shock and fade. Uh, those are the most common things you will see spelled out and prescribed in a warranty for this kind of product. Hmm? These warranties, again, can be anywhere from none or five years up to 40 years or some 45 year uh, film integrity properties out there as well. Again, uh, for the painted portion of this substrate off to the side, because that's a different presentation, uh, we're talking about excessive chalking, excessive color fade, and then delamination of the top coat or, or the primer to the substrate. That's your film integrity, right? Is that paint going to stick on there long term? And great, it's sticking, but is it going to lose its color and is it going to chalk, which is a loss of its gloss um, over time? There's a lot of things that control this. The paint formula is very important. Uh, the proper application on the coil line is important. Installation is important. Um, so yeah, environmental conditions play a part, but there can be a significant difference between the paint types. So let's see in a little bit. Chalking. Chalking is exactly what it kind of sounds like it's a white chalky substance that comes off the, the painted finish. And this is a degradation of the resin or the polymer system. It's breaking down into smaller pieces so it can come loose from the surface. And with that comes the embedded pigment particles, uh, which now um, are fading due to UV. Mm -hmm. uh, high end paints such as PVDFs and even the SMPs are going to be 20, 25, 30 years of. Uh, against chalking. Uh, there is an ASTM method that measures this. It's developed on a scale of zero to 10. The higher the number, the better. So you might see warranty language that says, you know, in 30 years, we'll not chalk in excess of eight rating or a six rating. Uh, again, the higher the number, the better uh, for chalking. Color fade. Uh, probably the one that most people are actually concerned about. We, we actually don't see a lot of chalking in the high-end paint systems anymore. It's pretty rare. So then it comes down to film integrity and color fade. Um, obviously, it's UV attack on the pigments. We measure this by a measurement that's called a delta E, which is a color uh, computer measurement that happens. Uh, delta E is the total kind of visual change that has occurred. The average human eye can start to pick up color change between 0.5 and 1 delta E unit. Mm -hmm. So your color warranties will read things like, you know, in 30 years, color fade will not exceed 5 delta E mm -hmm. units. Mm -hmm. And we try to put a representation here of what that looks like. These don't show up as well uh, in a presentation as they do in person. But the top here, this blue and this red, is the color it started at. The middle is a five unit change in color, and then the end one is a seven unit change in color. Mm -hmm. um, what we find is actually more important than the, the color number and fade is that it weathers evenly and that, that color fade is even, right? If your roof over 20, 30 years is fading evenly, you're probably not gonna notice that it's faded. But if you have a couple panels or a section that's fading differentially, that's going to stand out um, and be an eyesore. And we have a picture here of this uh, lovely home, which I think was down in Alabama. And you can see that there's some panels here, a section of roof that are holding their color better uh, than the rest of the, the panels here. And there's a couple of reasons why that might happen. Film thickness could have varied um, throughout this run. 
but often what happens when we see this is they've actually mixed two different paint systems together on a roof. So the darker, maybe an SMP, where these other ones that have faded might be a polyester. Mm -hmm. We call those uh, candy striped or candy cane houses mm -hmm. or, or buildings when we see that. Mm -hmm. The other big issue for um, warranty is film integrity, right? We want this paint to stick on there as long as possible. Uh, delamination or lack of film integrity can be either the top coat to the primer, or it can be the whole paint system down to the substrate. Uh, you get visible bubbling or peeling back of the paint, cracking, lost top coat. This is a tough one because there can be a lot of reasons why this fails. Um, it can be low film, it can be incorrect pretreatment, if the curing time on the paint line may not have been right. It could have been too long or too short. It can be an incompatibility between the top coat and the primer that was used. It can be due to installation damage and scratches that occurred during installation that have now created an opening in that film that allows water and ice and, and whatnot to get in there and cause it to come apart. Some other failures that we see a lot, um, and, and this is where we talk about other types of materials being used with painted metal. So um, galvanic corrosion or dissimilar metals is a really big deal, especially in marine or corrosive environments. So uh, you got to make sure that the metals you're using together are compatible. There's a lot of guidelines and tech bulletins around that in the industry. You want to make sure that the sealants you're using are not going to cause corrosion. Uh, metal filings or swarf that are left on the surface will rust and it it looks like the painted metal is rusting but it's not it's those little particulates on top that are rusting wet stack that's a uh, corrosion that occurs while these panels are nested and stored before installation if moisture gets in between them that can cause a lot of damage and then not really a failure but something to understand with light gauge coated metal is oil canning that's that buckling or shape that you get uh, on standing seam roofs sometimes. Um, and there's ways to minimize that and design around that. This picture right here is a dissimilar metal issue. This is a house 300 feet off the surf break in La Jolla, California. They use stainless steel attachments for that gutter um, on the eve of that zinc loom painted house. And what's happening is the zinc loom is sacrificing itself um, to save the stainless steel. Hmm? and it is down to red rust to base steel mm -hmm. in these pictures at every attachment point. Mm -hmm. So we have some more pictures tell the story, um, right? This is galvanic corrosion. Um, the greater part uh, things are on the galvanic chart, the worse this condition is going to occur. Proximity to the ocean um, is our biggest concern. Um, so this is a stainless steel lighting canister recessed through painted galvalum. And that ring, which, which comes in as a paint failure to us on a warranty claim, uh, that paint is bubbling up and coming loose. And the reason it's doing that is because the galvalum surface underneath is corroding away to protect the stainless light fixture that's there. Mm -hmm. So there's no substrate left for that paint to adhere to anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and this occurs, can occur within months or a year or less of installation if conditions are right. It's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Other incompatible materials. Um, you got to make sure that you don't put wet concrete right up against uh, pre-painted metal. You will get corrosion at that interface. You got to put a watertight barrier um, or a sealant in there. Um, and then treated wood. Uh, wood is often treated with copper compounds that are detrimental to painted metal. Um, this is a, um, it's actually Pat Benatar's house in Hawaii. Uh, this treated lumber on this upper deck was leaching out and dripping on the metal roof underneath. And, and once you got out past that deck, there was no corrosion. But you had spots of corrosion forming because of the chemicals coming out of that wood. Um, the house on the top here, this is concrete on the right, poured up against the wall of the painted gavel. And you can see a little bit at the top here, that paint is bubbling and pulling away because of the corrosion. That is the same house that had the stainless steel light fixture issue as well. So a lot of installation problems with that home. This is the swarf or, or metal filings. This comes from drilling uh, through fasten or any cutting that happens on the surface during install, which is fine. You can drill and you can cut if you do it properly, but you got to clean these little shavings, metal filings off because they stick in the paint. They're a little bit warm. They stick in the paint and then it cause these little rust spots. And again, it's not the painted panel rusting. It's the little particulates on top that are rusting. 
very, very hard to remove uh, that stain once that occurs. So um, we usually see this kind of complaint come in right after installation and it's pretty identifiable even from pictures. And there's a lot of tech bulletins around how to avoid this and how to clean that surface after install. Wet stack, again, this is corrosion that occurs in packaging or in the bundles before it's installed. It's due to the presence of moisture and a lack of oxygen. You get this kind of really light blistering um, or bubbling of the paint. Uh, again, that's happening underneath the painted surface and pushing it up. So packaging is important. Uh, how this product is stored before installation is really important and, and the NCCA has a lot of guidelines around that. You wanna store it inside away from the elements if you can. It's a picture of oil canning, which again is not a paint failure, but something that uh, is encountered using pre-painted metal panels. You can see this buckling that takes place. I really like the picture on the bottom. Your panel design can help with this. So by adding styrations or some more forming in there, you can get rid of that look. Uh, changes where the stress points are. Making sure that your roof deck is level and plumb. Uh, you can also use stiffener, uh, stiffener beading or, or panels behind these to help pop those out as well. The lower the gloss you're coating, we talked about low gloss, low sheen, the more matte finish you have, the less obvious this is too. Uh, you just don't see it because it's not reflecting the light as much. So how do we avoid any of these bad things happening? Well, there's a lot. The paint companies have to formulate a really good paint, right? And, and get it to the applicator correctly. Uh, has to be formulated for the conditions it's going in. The coil cot coders got to know what they're doing. They got to apply the right paint at the right temperature with the right well and cure time. You want to mix batches or incompatible paints. And then you want to use, uh, you know, a reputable panel manufacturer who knows how to, to fabricate this material and package it appropriately so it gets to the job site in good condition. And then you got to use an installer who knows how to work with metal, uh, which is sometimes a roadblock in our industry. A lot of um, contractors aren't comfortable with metal, don't know how to work with it. Um, so you do have to handle it a little bit more carefully before it's installed. And once it's installed, it's got this incredible longevity. Mm -hmm. And then cleaning is important. Again, a car analogy. You would never own your car for 10 years and not ever wash it and expect your paint to look good. So um, there is some cleaning, washing down, uh, removal of debris that needs to take place. And again, most of the warranties have that spelled out um, as to what those guidelines are. Mm -hmm. So to kind of wrap up here on the constructs of a coating warranty, because they're not all written the same from every supplier, um, the headlines will grab your attention. The headlines will often say things like lifetime or 30 years, but you got to read in to see what that means, right? Lifetime warranties are typically prorated after 20 or 30 years. 30 years may mean just the film integrity and your color and fade may have some other duration. Hmm? Um, so you got to read in a bit. And then again, how much color fade is being allowed uh, in that time period uh, compared to another supplier. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's usually some caveats again around marine locations. The warranty should call out a definition for that. The example I have here, it's a thousand feet, right? So if you're less than a thousand feet from the coastline, that's deemed a marine application. You gotta have some social stuff to get a warranty. Mm -hmm. Again, I think I just already said this, right? Make sure you read it, make sure you understand it have the conversation with your supply chain, make sure everyone's on the same page. So we're at the summary. Any questions? I know I think we're right on, oh, we're a little over time. Any questions? Who's still with me? Oh, thanks, Michelle. I've got a bunch of questions, but we're a little bit over time, so I'll kind of, kind of just want to ask two that seem to be the most uh, pertinent and, and were asked a couple of times. Um, you talked about delaminating and, and problems that happen to panels during storage and transportation. Um, can you address field repair for those scratched or damaged coil coated products? Yeah, yeah. And um, if you go out to our website, there's a lot of guidelines around that. It's a, That's a tough one. So our recommendation is on very light scratches that aren't very deep, that you can't really see from a few feet back, you probably want to leave those alone. Mm -hmm. um, if, if not, you want to use an air dry touch up paint that is the same chemistry or system. If you're using a PVDF, you can get air dry PVDFs. And you want to apply as little touch up paint as possible because it is going to weather differently long term. Um, 
if it's substantial damage of any kind, you probably want to pull panels and replace them. Now, uh, on an older installation that has weathered, it's 20, 25 years old, or something significant has happened to that roof for some reason that's caused a lot of damage, and an uninstall is not really feasible, it's a weather tight type of thing, or it's just the way it's designed, it's going to be more problematic to pull that material off. Um, you can field paint uh, this material, and again, there are air dry, field applied, high end PBDF based paints available. Uh, the trick there is finding a contractor who really knows what they're doing and will do that properly. But yeah, you can field paint uh, almost all of these systems once they're installed. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question about uh, somebody's asking about the, the different parameters on gloss and sheen uh, from mm -hmm. different painting companies' parameters. Is there an independent like ASTM standard for those? So there is an ASTM test method for measuring gloss that everyone adheres to. Uh, but as far as specifying what that range is, what, what you want your gloss to be or your sheen to be, that is between supplier and end customer to determine. The you do need a range. It's usually a 10 point range, 15 point range. It'll usually be like a five to 10 or a 10 to 20 range. And within that, you're, you're really not gonna pick up you know, with the I, a difference from a 20 to a 10. <laughs> um, but the, the test method is prescribed um, and dictated by ASTM. But what you want that spec to be, that's up to you and your supplier hmm, to determine. Hmm. Michelle, we're over. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. Really appreciate it. Uh, great presentation as, as usual. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, in the email tomorrow, there'll be a link to follow up. You can always go to steelscape.com. I think actually Michelle's email is, uh, address is listed there so you can get that information. Also in tomorrow's email is a link to the recording. So if you wanna review this material or you wanna download the uh, presentation, you can do that as well. Um, a reminder, AIA reporting and certifications can be handled automatically. So please allow five business days. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. We're doing another webinar on December 15th on single skin metal panels and lead standards and certification. Uh, plus lead standards and certifications presented by AEP SPAN. Uh, this is a brand new course, so you're gonna wanna make sure you register for this one. Uh, next year, we have a webinar scheduled every month and we're working hard to get the complete lists out so you can plan your CEUs for the entire year. And I know in January, we're doing a webinar with MetalCon Live on the state of the industry with uh, leading experts and economists who are gonna discuss what to expect in 2023. Uh, most of our webinars are scheduled for the third Thursday of the month at the same time, so you can block out your calendar now if you want. Uh, and you can always find the latest information at metalarchitecture.com slash webinars. Michelle, you always do such a great presentation. You're fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you. And thank you again for the, the date change. Very appreciative. Thanks to all for attending, and I hope to see you in December. Have a good Thanksgiving, everyone.